76. That could be a good number in a full season of football. 76 receptions. 76 yards rushing or receiving per contest. 76 total points allowed in the fourth quarter over 17 games. But in the 2002 season, the number 76 was one for the record books. That's how many sacks that Houston Texans quarterback David Carr took, nearly five per game. It wasn't the only record he set that year either. You can probably tell the Texans' first season was anything but pretty, but as you'll see with Carr, it had its moments. An opportunistic defense and proven coaching staff produced many unexpected results. Some of them atrocious, sure, but some of them good. And yet the number one overall pick that year mostly struggled to lead an offense that looked like a typical expansion team, and not just in its first season, but several seasons. Was Carr a bust like his draft classmate Joey Harrington or fellow top pick Tim Couch? Or was he set up to fail from day one? Comment below with your thoughts and shout out topics I should cover in future videos. Alright guys, here comes the boom. This is David Carr's bizarre 76 sack season. Try to say that five times fast. Six years after bidding farewell to their beloved Oilers, the city of Houston was ready to embrace a new franchise and a new identity, the Texans. What better way to build your franchise than by drafting a quarterback first overall, and one who led the NCAA in yards and touchdowns, Fresno State's David Duke Carr. In 2001, he led his Bulldogs to 11 wins, tying a school record. He threw for over 4,300 yards and 42 touchdowns against just seven interceptions, helping him finish fifth in Heisman Trophy voting. With a cannon for an arm and a 4.67 40-yard dash, Carr was a specimen for Texans head coach Dom Capers to mold into a franchise cornerstone. Carr's offensive tools weren't the most robust, but would allow for him to develop alongside them. The anchor to all of this was future Hall of Fame tackle Tony Baselli. Nothing better than a three-time All-Pro protecting your blind side. At receiver, Corey Bradford was entering his prime and could make for a solid number two option. The potential top target for Carr, Jabbar Gaffney, was a first-team All-American just a year ago at the University of Florida. And in the backfield, James Allen had rushed for over 1,100 yards with the Bears just two seasons prior. By contrast, the defense was much more veteran-stacked and could give Carr some favorable field position now and then. Pro Bowl cornerback and Houston native Aaron Glenn, Super Bowl 35 winning linebacker Jamie Sharper, and a reliable run-stuffing Pro Bowl lineman in Gary Walker would lead the way. The coaching personnel also had impressive resumes, especially with newer teams. In 1996, the head coach Capers guided the Carolina Panthers to a 12-4 record and a playoff win over the defending champion Dallas Cowboys. They were seventh in scoring and with the aid of coordinator Vic Fangio, allowed the second fewest points. The two reunited in Houston. Not bad for an expansion team, right? Well my friends, behold the turd in the punch bowl, the offensive line. First of all, Houston had selected Baselli following a season hampered by shoulder problems. He never played another down, retiring at the age of 30. Second, the Texans started two rookies, right guard Fred Weary and left tackle Chester Pitts. To be fair. Uh, to be fair. To be fair. Well, to be fair. Both players held onto their job for several years, but comment below with one team that had a winning record with at least two rookie offensive linemen for 16 games. I don't think there are many that come to mind. The Texans began their first campaign as if it were a film script. What better way to be welcomed into the NFL than to face America's team, your in-state competition, the five-time Super Bowl champion Cowboys led by Emmitt Smith? The Texans began their first drive with a deep dropback. With plenty of pass protection, Carr fired downfield looking for Corey Bradford. Fortunately, he drew a pass interference. Three plays later, on his first official pass, Carr found his tight end. Complete down to the five, diving for the end zone. Who else besides me misses Mike Patrick's voice? All right, well, as spectacular of a start that was, it was the next 40 minutes or so that foreshadowed Houston's true passing attack, or lack thereof. Carr got dumped six times, fumbled a handoff, and completed just 10 of 22 throws on the night. Jermaine Lewis certainly didn't do him many favors either. On the other hand, the defense wasn't phased by the first game jitters, sacking quarterback Quincy Carter three times and picking him off once, although they could have easily had three or four more. Tied 10-10 in the fourth quarter, Carr picked a good time to deliver one of his few second-half completions. Carr. Bradford! Touchdown! A late safety sealed the Cowboys' fate, giving Texans fans an unprecedented Week 1 victory. They became the first expansion team since the 61 Vikings to start their inaugural season undefeated. 
All right then, who was next on the schedule? A Chargers team that won just one game two years ago. This would be a cakewalk. Nah, of course not. Carr was sacked a career high nine times. Nine times. Nine times. In a 24 to three beatdown, he completed just six of his 25 throws for 87 yards. Linebacker Ben Lieber recorded three of those nine to lead the Bolts, including a late strip sack in the end zone that Ray Lee Johnson recovered for a touchdown. Week three was more of the same, under 100 yards passing, just four sacks this time, but only three points on the board. Hey now, they only surrendered 19 points against Peyton Manning, so if anything, call it a moral victory. Just like week one, the Texans came out firing on all cylinders in Philadelphia in week four. An early touchdown to Bradford, and then some sweet field position following an Eric Brown interception. But after the first of seven sacks, the wheels came off. You can thank Hall of Fame safety Brian Dawkins for that. He became the first player in NFL history to record the following in a single game. A fumble recovery, an interception, a touchdown reception on a fake punt no less, and a sack. Carr sort of made up for this with this beauty of a pass to Bradford in the third quarter for his second touchdown. Despite the defense forcing three turnovers, the offense couldn't make up so much ground, falling 35 to 17. Carr was already taking a beating, 26 sacks in just four games. Fortunately, his team had a week five bye and used it to their advantage. Though he took five sacks, Carr had his most efficient game, completing 12 of 23 attempts for 218 yards, a touchdown, and zero picks. To give you a sense of how anemic the offense had been most of the year, it was Carr who scored the team's first rushing touchdown, racking up 17 of his 50 yards on the ground. The Texans kept it close and mustered their highest point total in a 31-24 loss. But it was one step forward, two steps back for the offense, as Carr took eight more sacks in a 34-17 loss to the Cleveland Browns. Hey, they actually had a winning record that year. The pass protection struggled to make progress in Carr's first six games. He had already been taken down 39 times, or six and a half per game. Houston was just one and five, but as we'd see over the course of the season, Carr and company demonstrated resilience. They'd have fire in their bellies for this next one, versus the last team Coach Capers worked for, the Jaguars. Jacksonville sacked Carr four times, but the most brutal shot they inflicted came from this Marcus Stroud clothesline. Say what you will about his accuracy, but Carr was as tough as nails to come back from hits like this and never miss a snap. He posted his highest passer rating of the season at 114.1. Tied at 18 in the fourth quarter, the Texans pulled off some trickery on a punt return with a lateral from Gaffney to Aaron Glenn. Chris Brown finished off the drive with a game-winning field goal, and the Texans improved to 2-5. But like I said, one step forward, two steps back. The good news was that Carr was sacked just twice. The bad news? He threw two picks, one fewer than the total number of points his team scored against the Cincinnati Bungles. As we know, that was their name back then. I'm just kidding. It was 3-3 when the Texans had driven the ball 69 yards to the Bengals' 5. David Carr had been picked off 97 passes, but Artrell Hawkins, he could go all the way, 102 yards. John Kitna's four touchdowns led the route. The 35-point defeat was by far Houston's worst that year. They would have to quickly regroup for their first matchup against the former Oilers, the Tennessee Titans. The Texans hung tough on both sides of the ball. They forced two picks against Steve McNair and limited him to just 109 yards on 10 completions. Led by linebacker Keith Bullock, Tennessee got to Carr four times, but the rookie fought till nearly the final minute. Down 17-3 with just over three minutes, Carr capped off a lengthy drive by avoiding pressure and tucking the ball into the arms of Jared Baxter. The Texans' defense stood up the Titans once more, giving Carr one more chance, but he couldn't come through in the clutch. It would be two more years until Carr finally defeated Tennessee. Week 11, a rematch against the Jaguars, was another close but no cigar effort. After nearly throwing a pick six, Carr turned in one of his stronger performances, tying a season high with 22 completions. In the second half, he showed off his speed, rushing for not one, but two touchdowns. But that was too little too late for a Texans offense that had only converted two of 11 third downs and gave up four sacks. 24-21 Jags. This presented the 2-8 Texans with another challenging opportunity to bounce back, as they'd have three straight games against teams with winning records. In Week 12 against the New York Giants, they were outgamed 369 yards to 212. Carr struggled through the air, just 10 of 23, and took five sacks, although he racked up a season-high 54 yards on the ground. Taking sack number 57 on the year, he had set a record for rookie QBs. The previous mark, I mentioned him at the beginning, Tim Couch with the 99 Browns, who went 2-14. and 14. 
Some guy named Chris Palmer was calling the plays back then. At least Carr could depend on a reliable coordinator in Chris Palmer. Well, shit. Well, anyway, the Texans forced three turnovers and held onto a slim 16 to 14 lead following Chris Bryant's field goal halfway through the fourth quarter. This was their first victory against a team with a winning record. The Giants were six and four. In week 13 against the Colts, Brad Scioli, who had two sacks in their first meeting, racked up three more. His five total sacks on Carr were the most by any player that season, and oddly, he only had two more sacks in his other 14 games. Conceding a total of six sacks and converting just two of 15 on third down, the Texans' offense was, to quote Patches of Hulahan, but as useful as a flavored lollipop in a 19-3 loss. And if you thought that performance was bad, take a look at what they mustered against the would-be AFC North champion Pittsburgh Steelers. Imagine being outgained in yards 422 to 47 and completing just three passes. But it was the Texans' defense that put up some points. Kenny Wright recovered a fumble and found the end zone to start the scoring. And Aaron Glenn had perhaps the game of his life. He picked off Tommy Maddox twice and took it to the house both times. And intercepted Aaron Glenn, and Glenn will win it and end this one with a flurry. As you can tell from the 47 yards, Carr didn't have much of a role in this one. He threw just 10 passes total, completing three for just 33 yards. That was just 10 yards more than the 23 that he lost from his four sacks. The Steelers surrendered six sacks and coughed it up five times in a 24 to six blowout at home. The four and nine Texans would only score one more offensive touchdown over their final three games, a one yard run from Jonathan Wells. His defense couldn't quite replicate what they did to the Steelers, so Houston stalled out at 4-12, more on that shortly. And as was the case with his previous three games, Carr failed to pass for a touchdown in his last three. The silver lining was that he only took eight more sacks, finishing the season with 76. Remember, through six games, he was on pace for 104. And who got the honors of setting the sack record for Carr and breaking Randall Cunningham's previous mark of 72 in 1986? None other than eight-time All-Pro and Hall of Famer Bruce Smith. So what ultimately came of the 0-2 Texans? Well first, they finished with the NFL's worst offense, averaging just 13.3 points per game and scoring only 21 touchdowns, five worse than the next team, the Cowboys. The defense surrendered 22.3 points, which was a respectable 20th, given the offense's inability to put together successful drives. That actually marked the second best defense of any NFL expansion team. The team sent two of its standouts to the Pro Bowl, something never achieved by an expansion team before then. It was the third time for Aaron Glenn and the second time for Gary Walker. Their four wins were tied for the second most of any expansion team. Only Capers' 95 Panthers had more with seven. Nonetheless, such a record earned them the third pick in the 03 draft, where they selected wide receiver and future Hall of Famer, fingers crossed, Andre Johnson. As for Carr, he was sacked on 14.6% of his dropbacks, basically once every seven times. He finished tied for the third most fumbles in a single season with 21, but set another record by recovering 12 of them. But all that aside, you have to give him credit. Despite all the punishment he took, he didn't back down, becoming the first expansion team quarterback to take every snap in a full season. He was also just one of three QBs to take every snap that season. With 2,592 passing yards, and despite just nine TDs against 15 picks, he tied for third in Offensive Rookie of the Year voting. And what about the Texans going forward? Even with an elite receiver in Johnson, the Texans endured the same struggles we associate with most expansion franchises. They hit a new low in 05 by winning just two games, leading to Capers' firing. For the third time in his career, Carr led all quarterbacks in sacks taken with 68. In 06, under new coach Gary Kubiak, he completed a league-best 68.3% of his passes and took just 41 sacks. But that still wasn't good enough for new GM Rick Smith, who brought in Matt Schaub and left Carr for free agency. From that point on, Carr would only remain in the NFL as a backup, first with the Panthers for a year, then with the Giants, then shortly with the 49ers, and back to the Giants one more time. But even though he never took a snap for Big Blue that year, he got what he had worked for all along, a Super Bowl ring. So what do you think about David Carr? Where would he rank among the biggest busts of all time? Or was he a true talent without proper pass protection? Comment below with your thoughts and let me know what other topics I should cover in future videos, football or otherwise. Thanks so much for watching everyone. I'm Nick and I'll see you next time right here on Sudden Death Sports.